awful. Okay, we move now on to our final speaker before the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Besma Momani is a professor of political science at the University of Waterloo in Canada and a senior fellow at the Centre for International Governance and in Innovation and a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. So over to you, Besma. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and thank you for the invitation and uh, really great to be with this wonderful panel. Um, so I guess I'm going to add to the depressing uh, narrative that you've already heard. I think we're, we're really piling on, but it, it really is the reality. And I think um, what we've heard already really paints a, a pretty, you know, um, dismal picture. And I'm going to add to it with a few more, I think, context. One, I'll start with the global sort of macroeconomic situation, because I think, you know, indeed, and as, as Philip has noted, um, certainly I think the global economy is suffering. And, and there is some positive signs of recovery. Um, the IMF has noted that there will be a GDP recovery. Um, but I think what we can realize uh, increasingly, there's inequities in that recovery, both within countries and globally. Um, and that's really important to keep in mind. Um, certainly, I think the same um, economic scarring that we see domestically in the Western countries is certainly found in the Middle Eastern countries. And these are really worrying trends. So first of all, I want to point out that prior to the pandemic, um, the Middle East, um, in terms of extreme poverty, um, was the worst performer, uh, where everywhere else there was an improvement. Um, this was the one region that continued to falter. And I think this is a really important point where all other global economic indicators of um, distribution of wealth, of even even socio-political uh, factors like happiness and faith in government has continued to go up globally but it's gone down in the Middle East. So we're really starting from a very low baseline. And that's really important um, because I think what I'm going to paint this in terms of a picture that's become full circle is that this is going to also be a political crisis. So it's not just an economic one that we're facing. I think ultimately um, in the Middle East, it's going to be political. So first of all, you know, what are the implications uh, of all this, of course? Um, is thinking about what is it going to mean for, for satisfaction politically? What is it going to mean for the stability of the region? Um, certainly, I think low oil prices will continue, and that's an important factor, of course, because the region is very dependent on oil revenue, not just the Gulf countries, even countries like uh, the Levant countries, um, right to Egypt, are very dependent on um, oil remittances or workers' remittances coming from the oil-producing states. Um, that is going to decline, and I think the structural forces there of we're going to travel less uh, I think this is a reality. Uh, we are all, I think, facing new conversations, good conversations about building back better, or about the, the value of thinking about a more sustainable environmental future. And that all, I think, in my view, portrays to seeing less and less use of, of carbon um, and less uh, fuels. So I think we are going to see a structural shift in the, in the global economy. That does mean the Middle East, which has as its basic source of income, um, this very, I think, polluting um, or, you know, source means that I think globally, we are going to see uh, less travel, um, less dependence on fossil fuels. And that is not good for the Middle East, even though it's good for all of us, uh, globally speaking. So knowing that, uh, that means also, I think, uh, certainly the revenue is going to decrease in many of these countries. Um, and we also know that um, throughout uh, the region, um, the small business sector has suffered enormously, um, just like many countries in the West, similarly in the Middle East, um, small businesses are suffering the most uh, with repeated closures, um, with insecurity, with the lack of faith in the global or even the domestic economic uh, recovery, all means that there's there is uh, less and less, um, I think, um, variety or diversity in the structure of these economies, which in my view is really terrible for crony capitalism, which means we're going to shift back to, and I think there had been some you know, modest gains in sort of diversifying sources of economic growth in a country um, and employment opportunity to those small businesses. I think of all the time and effort that more than um, you know, more than a decade of international financial institutions and foreign aid has gone into sort of supporting youth with entrepreneurship and uh, small business activity. All of that, I think, is under great risk. Um, and so we're returning to the Middle East of even more crony capitalism, which I think is very terrible for the economic recovery of these countries. Um, as you may all know, the Middle East also depends on a very shallow tax base. 
Um, so whereas in the West, we sort of depend on uh, income tax, a little bit of corporate and, and consumption taxes, the Middle East is almost wholly on consumption taxes. Um, that's partly because, you know, there's a lot of cronyism and corruption, and no one wants to claim their income tax. So there's certainly a lot of, I think, mismanagement on government's uh, part here. But the, the reality is that consumption taxes um, will mean a more regressive distribution on poor people. Um, we are going to see more of that, you know, raise. And, and I think as the old adage is of no taxation without representation, that is only going to add to the political frustration on the street of people being taxed further and further. And we even saw in rich countries like Saudi Arabia, a new slew of taxes coming through throughout COVID, uh, including value added taxes, I believe up to 18%. So really quite significant um, kinds of tax uh, increases. Of course, uh, many of the countries in the region depend on tourism and travel. Um, that is a really important sector. It um, benefits about 25% of the Egyptian population. Um, many of them are, are you know, either lower middle class or, or even the poor. Um, everything from small handicrafts to um, obviously hotels, um, you know, guides. It really is a very important employment sector. I mean, frankly, I don't see people getting on these kinds of, you know, once in a lifetime journeys to places like Egypt. These are not frequent destinations with all due respect. It's not like going to the Caribbean where many of us, you know, we go for, you know, at the drop of a, of a dime, we just go. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a quick vacation. Uh, we know from even Thomas Cook and other sort of travel agencies, these trips to the Middle East, they're sort of like, it takes five years to plan. Uh, they don't happen overnight. Uh, people don't really think of them as a, as a quick stop. It really requires a lot of time and effort. Well, we know the economic recovery in, in many parts of the Western world where a lot of the tourists are coming from is slow. And more importantly, as Yara pointed out really well, is that this is a, a region that continues to have poor um, reporting of, of what are the actual cases. I don't think we can take any of the numbers coming out of the region as trusted. Uh, we know that there is uh, certainly high, high vaccine hesitancy, uh, certainly seen some numbers that were unbelievably off the charts, um, you know, 48% of Jordanians have doubts in the vaccine. Um, and so this is going to be a long time before we see this stamped out and travelers are just not going to go. Um, and the traveler demographic tends to be older that go to these kinds of destinations, once in a lifetime destinations. So I see a real mismatch here where we're not going to see the tourists go to the Middle East to these wonderful destinations. And that means less revenue for a lot of these governments and less jobs for the people on the ground. Um, the other thing I was going to point out is that um, certainly it, we have a number of countries that are on the brink uh, of failure, uh, Lebanon being the one that I think stands out. Um, it is really literally days away uh, from having the lights off completely, from being unable to import food. 80% um, of the food that comes into that country is imported. Um, this is a disaster when the currency has absolutely collapsed. Um, no longer any faith in the Lebanese uh, currency, and uh, no one wants to lend. Uh, this is the other challenge, and I think we're all facing the rise of populism, nationalism, um, globally, and, and we see that. And, and as you know, Philippa noted, this almost hoarding of vaccines. I mean, I think it's really pitiful that in the G7 basically got together to offer one billion. Um, I mean, it was really, really uh, underperforming. And the IMF had did some fantastic studies that showed. You know, vaccinate everybody. You will uh, you know, accrue nine trillion dollars in in profit globally. I mean, the math is there, but why didn't we provide? Because it, clearly, we know that there's benefits of a public good to vaccinate everyone. It's because we are facing a more introverted world. Um, I see it in, in all Western countries. Certainly, um, you folks are seeing it at home as well, which is this. You know, we want to sort of uh, meet the needs of the of the domestic population first. And so we're vaccinating, uh, frankly, a healthy 15 year old before we're vaccinating, you know, a vulnerable 80 year old in the Middle East. That has become what we've done. We basically put a price tag, a value on life in the Middle East versus in the West. Um, the West is going to have a real hard time recovering. Um, small, medium enterprises account for 70% of employment in, in the Western world. Um, I mean, I can tell you also as a small business owner, it's really tough. And around me are, are complete vacancies throughout um, you know, my town here. And I think the same could be replicated across the Western world. It's going to be tough. Um, similarly, we're looking at job dislocations with digitization. 
Uh, we're seeing retail sectors decimated. Women are the ones that are paying the highest price of this unemployment, and it's across the Western world. So this is all to say there are more needs at home today, and, and that means people are less generous globally. And we see that in the lack of cooperation. Certainly, I can go into all day of how Trump ruled, ruined sorry, um, you know, global cooperation for this crisis. Uh, we can go on and on, but it's the reality. And so that means as these countries go to the international financial institution asking for money, um, which is the only source to get that money because the international financial markets don't look at them as being safe bets, um, it's going to be at a high price. Um, and kudos to the IMF for saying that we're not going to impose, you know, a tough conditionality for now. Um, I think those are really great words, but I think when it comes to the reality, we're going to see tough conditions at the end. So I painted a terrible picture for you, and I'll just wrap up quickly and just say, what does that mean for, for the political situation? Because that's what I think is really worrying. And if you look at the Arab Spring, and we think about, um, and some of us have done a lot of work on this, you know, what brought the Arab Spring, it was often because of the political economic situation, a frustration and lack of faith in governments, which they proved are not, they're not doing any better under COVID. Um, certainly lack of jobs, unemployment, the median age of throughout the Middle East is about 20. Um, and where unemployment is about officially in some countries, uh, with exception of the Gulf, 25% in the general population, it's maybe double, if not triple that amongst young people. So young people are the ones that are paying the price of this, um, of this recession. Um, they have time on their hands. They're highly educated, cosmopolitan, hyper-connected. And the only thing that I think that, that really um, will satisfy them is if they see some political change. So we're looking at, I think, a very uh, um, short to medium term um, set of political instability throughout the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Besman. I, I think we've seen that in so many uh, conflict areas in the past. If younger people have no sense of hope for their own futures, regardless of what's driving that, then you start to get desperation and people become open to um, dangerous influences and, and, and instability. Um, and, and I think that is a concern. I mean, coming back to Clinton's comment, it's the economy stupid. You know, in the end of the day, you know, particularly as we come out of this, the and, and you get past the acute, let's all work together and rally around in our community. When people start really hurting in their homes, then the anger will start to uh, will start to build. And as you say, I mean, the the G7, the seven richest countries offering to eventually give one billion uh, doses when we need 15 billion. And, you know, it's estimated that this pandemic is probably going to continue for another three years because it's not just we haven't vaccinated an elderly person in the Middle East, we haven't even vaccinated healthcare workers, you know, so I mean we are really, we're really failing. I mean, as, as chair of the vaccine group, this is the thing that has angered me the most. We had such warm rhetoric last year and we have literally failed utterly. Uh, 